Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 28. Hear now the word of the Lord. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image that I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in to the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the flaming furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to go and give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. This is the word of the Lord. I have a question. It's a question that I brought with me into seminary and never got a good answer for. And it's simply this. What determines what can go into a children's Bible? Is there a committee? Or is it just up to the editor to decide whether we can put a story in? Who makes these decisions? Because some of them, they're pretty strange. When you think back to the stories that we tell our kids, preschoolers and elementary school students, we've got stories like Noah's Ark, which we illustrate with bright colors as we tell them about how God flooded the world and the entire human race was just about wiped out. 
We have these stories like David and Goliath, where a war is won via champion combat to the death. Where a young man literally kills a larger man by bashing his head in with a stone. We've got stories like Moses freeing the Israelites by calling down plagues to destroy the Egyptian crops, the water supplies, and let's not forget their firstborn sons. Or where he parted the sea, which was a glorious demonstration, and which ended with the entire Egyptian army drowning. How do we decide that these are the stories to teach children? And how is it that we somehow manage to tell these stories without including any of those parts of the endings? One of the worst offenders that I've seen, or at least the most interesting, is the Veggie Tales version of the Book of Esther, in which the people plotting to kill the king and betray Esther were punished with the horrible punishment of being sent to an island where they would be tickled continuously forever. We soften these stories up. We choose these stories that have high body counts and then somehow manage to never finish them. We somehow manage to never get the full picture across as these children age as they grow into older students, into young adults, and then into the adults in our churches. We hear these stories as kids. And yet, for all of the power that there is, especially in these sorts of stories in the book of Daniel, and yet we never hear the ending. We never get the full picture. And I really do believe that this seems to happen more with Daniel than with any other book except for maybe Genesis. And so we're revisiting an old favorite this morning, the story of three young men, probably no older than boys, in fact, who have interesting names, which are repeated a whole bunch of times, and are thrown into a furnace. This, of course, is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, our friends with the fun names. You've probably heard the story if you spent any time in church, but if not, then you heard it just a few minutes ago. It's a pretty straightforward narrative where the king orders that all of his subjects bow down and worship an idol of gold that he's built whenever they hear music. This is a big ask. Can you imagine if every time you heard a song on the radio, if every time you heard a guy with a guitar on the street corner, you were commanded by the government to bow down and worship an idol that you probably couldn't even see? That's what the king of Babylon asked of his kingdom. And if they didn't, then the punishment was death. And after this decree goes out, his advisors tell him that there are these three Jewish kids, very young, who are being trained to be advisors in the court, who have refused the king's demand. They've refused to bow down to his idol. And he sees it as a sign of disrespect. He sees it as a sign that they're not fully invested in what he is trying to do for the kingdom. So he calls them to his court and tells them, look, if you are ready to bow down to my idol, then we're good. Good for you. You get to live. But if not, then I'm going to throw you into that furnace over there. And these kids, maybe with a bit of youthful rebellion in their voice, respond in an interesting sort of way. They don't just tell him, no king, we're not going to bow down. 
They don't tell him, well, you see, our religion demands that we not do that. Instead, what they tell him is, King, we don't even need to defend ourselves to you. It's not going to do any good. We're not going to convince you of anything with our words, and we're not going to be able to justify not bowing down. And if you throw us into the fire, then God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, even if you are right and we burn to death in there, we would rather do that than show you that we actually do serve you. We would rather die than bow down to you. This does not go over well with the king. And so he orders the fire heated up even more, as though being burned to death isn't bad enough. It has to be an exceptionally hot fire. And in fact, he gets it so hot that when these three kids are tied up and thrown in, the people who do the throwing die immediately before they can get back away from it. They just drop dead because it's so hot. But once they're in, something strange happens. The story pulls an interesting trick on us. I don't know if you noticed this, but I did. And that's that the story doesn't follow Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It doesn't say that they were in the fire and they looked over and beside them stood someone else. Someone sent by God. Instead, instead of following these faithful Jewish boys, the narration stays with the king as he looks on in confusion and asks his advisors who are with him, hey, didn't we just throw three people in there? What's the deal with the fourth guy? And why are they not dead? And is it just me or is there something kind of strange about that fourth figure? And so he calls them back out. And what they all find is that much to their amazement, none of these three boys are harmed. And there doesn't seem to be a fourth person after all, even though they just saw him with their eyes. And the king is so amazed by what he's seen that he professes on the spot that the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these three boys who stood rebellious before the king of the entire world that they knew. He professes that their God is the Lord of all. You see, we've been talking for a couple of weeks now about this simple biblical truth, this fundamental fact about the Christian faith, which is that we believe that God is always with us through good times and bad, through easy times and hard. And we're taking it situation by situation because it's a lot easier to say that from a distance. And yet when you're in the moment, it can be really challenging to see where God actually is in the time. And so if we take a moment just to think about that now, then when you find yourself in these different circumstances, it might be a little bit easier hopefully, to see that God is, in fact, still present. So, where is God? This is the question that we're looking at. Where is God in times of danger? Where is God in times of persecution? Where is God when the message of the world is that it's time to give up on him? See, these three Jewish boys knew that the king had demanded that they give up on God so that they could place their full trust in him. When he said bow, they should bow. And yet, they came back to him defiantly, saying, I know that you have threatened to throw us into fire if we don't listen to you. And yet it's more important that we stand firm on the promises of our God than to listen to you because 
we know that he is more powerful than your furnace could ever be. We can see the confidence of these kids in Scripture, of these young men. And we can see one simple fact, and that's this. It's that you can't stand firm if you don't know what you're standing for. They knew what they believed. They knew that it was of highest importance that they trust in God. And yet, Nebuchadnezzar demanded something otherwise. They had to make a choice. They had to decide and declare where their allegiance really was. When it came down to it, when their feet were to the fire, were they going to trust in God? Were they going to trust in His power? Or did they actually believe that Nebuchadnezzar was stronger and more important? Make no mistake, friends, what you do reveals where your allegiance is. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fact that they were able to say that we trust God more than you revealed that they truly were citizens of his kingdom. We have to ask ourselves that question too. What do our actions say about our allegiances? Where do we put our trust? Who or what do we think is the strongest factor in our lives? Do we think that it's God? Do we believe that our king is the Lord? Or do we think it's something else, some Nebuchadnezzar in our present day Babylon? What's the king of your life? Is it money? If you had to decide between giving up your things or giving up your faith, would you have to hesitate? Is the king of your life status? Is it most important that you maintain a respectable uh, demeanor? That other people look up to you? That they know that you have it together? Maybe more than they do? Is it success? Do you want to climb the ladder? Are you willing to sacrifice your faith? To do so? Worst of all, is it politics? Do you place your trust in the government? Where do your actions show that your allegiance is? Do you look more like Christ? Or do you look more like something else altogether? Friends, if you want to see God in your trials, then you have to start with the belief that God is present. If you want to see God in your trials, then you have to believe that he is Lord. Otherwise, you're just going to turn away and go to the things that truly seem real to you. And the true test is that last part of what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, which is that even if this doesn't work out, even if you throw us into the fire and we are consumed, even if this is how we die, our allegiance is still with God and we are still not going to bow down to you. That is a strong statement. How firm is your trust in the Lord? Is it strong enough to say that no matter what happens, we know that he is God, that he is the king of our lives, and nothing else is? Or is our foundation on something else, something that can be shaken by this world? And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing firm on their faith, are thrown into the fire, and everything seems terrible for a moment. 
It seems terrible until, that is, the king looks up and sees something strange. He notices that not only are these three still alive and walking around in the fire, but they're not alone. And the king is convinced because he's seen it with his own eyes in the faithfulness of these three and in the fact that they knew that they would not be alone. Friends, when you stand on your faith, it will make an impact. It's like a candle lit in a totally dark room. You can't miss it. There's no way not to see its effects. There's a quote from a book called Blue Like Jazz, which I really liked when I was younger. And it's at the very beginning and it says this. It says, I never liked jazz. It didn't resolve, it didn't make any sense. I never liked it until I saw someone who truly loved it. A man playing saxophone on the street. And I watched as he played and played and never once opened his eyes. And after that, I liked jazz. Sometimes you have to see somebody truly love something before you can even begin to understand it. There's something infectious about someone who's passionate about something. This is true with hobbies. This is true with music. And this is true with faith as well. When you have courage that surpasses explanation, people notice. When you have joy that exceeds reason, people notice. When you build, on, when you build your life on faith, and it bleeds into every single part. People will notice how you are at work, with your family, and most of all, they'll notice how you are when things get hard. They'll notice how you are in a crisis. Because that's where your alliance, where your allegiance is most clearly revealed. The reason for that, friends, is that nothing else, when it's crunch time, when you're in a foxhole, when things are truly difficult, and nothing else can offer hope, if you have hope, then there can be no question from anyone who sees that something powerful is happening. Chances are pretty good that you are not at risk of being thrown into a furnace. If you are, please call for help. But even if you're not staring down literal flames you know, I'm sure of it, you know what it means to walk through fire. Maybe you're in a difficult season in your marriage. Maybe you're having a hard time with your kids. Maybe you're struggling with addiction, with these things that you can't seem to shake. Maybe you're at the end of your rope and you don't know how you could possibly last even one more day, or maybe you're in the middle of some terrible grief or horrible, unexpected loss. Or maybe you're just worried about people getting sick. You can give in to the message of the world and say, you're right. I don't think God has anything for me right now. Not anymore, not in this. Or you can stand on the promises of the Lord and channel your inner rebellious youth and say, I don't have to justify myself to you right now because I know who I am and I know whose I am and he's bigger than whatever this world can put in my way. And you can walk bravely into whatever furnace comes your way 
Because when you walk by faith, you'll never walk alone. There's another one with you there in the fire. And he's already beaten death. He's already conquered hell. He's already seen everything that the enemy has to throw at you. Everything he's got in his arsenal. And it couldn't stop him. It didn't even slow him down. So when you walk by faith, you're walking with the one who's been through all of that already. You're walking with the one who bore your sin, your punishment, your guilt, your shame. And even that, as heavy as it is, couldn't hold him down, not even for three days. Because we know that he came out of the other side. Friends, I always end by saying go in peace. But today I want to say something else. Today, I want you to hear this. Go with strength. Go with courage. Go in confidence in the one who is protected by the King of Kings. And know that he will stand with you through every fire. And so what do we have to be afraid of? Why do we have to ask where our allegiance lies? We've seen it before, and we'll see it again. Friends, you are not alone. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here with us in every moment, in everything that we go through. Thank you for standing with us in the fires of life and protecting us when everything seems to be against us. Because, God, we know that you are the only one who's fighting for us. And we know that you are the only one we need. Lord, I pray that you would bless us today, that you would bless us as we go into this week, that you would keep us safe and healthy, and that by your name we would go with the strength and courage to shine your light into the world, to share your good news, to walk with the confidence of those who have been saved by faith. I pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, as we join together in song one final time this morning, I want to invite you, if you're feeling any kind of call on your life, if you're feeling any kind of conviction, if you're looking into the fire saying that you're ready to walk but not sure how, to give us a message, to get in touch, you can comment, you can send us a direct message, whatever works best for you. Because we want to walk with you. We want you to know that you don't have to go alone, but that there is a community of faith that is ready and excited to go with you. So let us join together in song one more time today as people who've been saved by the one who's stood through every fire.